Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 262. Two. That's Dos Says Dos. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Great, amazing. Boom, bang, boof. As you can tell, it's a nice sunny day today. The light is streaming in from the right hand side, thankfully. I've still got some light, I'll be able to catch that, so I'm happy with that. If you've listened via the podcast app, you'd have no idea what's happening here. So why not you click? Why not click onto the link in the show notes description, which is my website, excellentzinger.com. Click YouTube and you can see me in full 720p quality. And in some cases, if your computer allows you to, maybe 1080p. Just maybe. You'll see all the little pimples, all the weird grey hairs I have in my beard. The fact that I haven't had a haircut in a month because I'm trying to pretend I'm making an album. But I just can't be bothered to go to the barbershop and I don't want to get another crappy, you know, um, hood favourite East London barber to cut my hair and then, you know, for it to pretend for it to pretend like it's giving me a HD Odo Beckham fade, but for it to be in reality something I could do myself if I had a steady hand in a mirror. So um, that's not what I'm going to do. But anyway, regardless of all that, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are doing nice. I'm doing amazing. It's the weekend. Why not? pod in it why not pod got a couple of hours to spare before i head out to the gym get a little pump on so i thought i'd deliver a nice little podcast for all my podcast listening family hope you guys are well hydrated and rested all that stuff i'm not sure what you're gonna do for this saturday afternoon or saturday evening but whatever it is make sure you're safe make sure well hydrated you know i've got a nice bottle of water here that i'm well hydrated with make sure you're hydrated too this actual bottle of water actually from a retail establishment called morrison's which is a little um local delicatessen we have here similar to you know other delicatessens you might have around the world um they specialize in uh, providing very cheap uh weekly shopping for people like me who are pretending to be students but are actually grown adults who are working full-time jobs in order to make sure they don't die of despair but regardless of whatever it is i love it hope you guys are doing good man as well putting on a saturday is weird isn't it um you feel like you should be recovering from a night out or something but you know as i've mentioned in previous episodes i'm a little bit bored of waking up hungover i think i prefer going out to these big events such as you know tricks at mixed garage or you know the innovation that's happening in fold in a couple of weeks i prefer those big um going out sessions as opposed to the you know the kind of week by week every friday night after work sort of thing it's not that fun if anything the most fun you do end up having during the week is when you go out with your work friends between the days of like monday and wednesday or monday and thursday the friday night thing is an absolute pass for me especially now that i'm working closer to liverpool street station i'm seeing all the I'm seeing all the like, you know, adult Project X victims out there, you know, trying to make it a big night, trying to recreate the magic of previous, because that's what ended up happening. I don't have anything against people who go out, who kind of look forward to Friday, but it just fills me with sadness to imagine there's adults out there who are in a similar kind of age range that I am or in a similar kind of point in life, you know, where they have these responsibilities they have to take care of. Um that their that their that their lives or that their weeks are so full of dread, so full of meaningless, so boring that they're looking forward to one particular day in a week that they can quote unquote let their hair down, get a bit crazy, enjoy time with their friends, get drunk, and then go home, you know, and wake up in the morning, you know, I don't know, a hundred or so pound poorer with a headache and all that stuff. It's just a bit, you know, and then you waste you end up wasting a day too because you end up waking up hungover, which you waste, you know, countless hours in the morning not being awake and alert and on it so it's just a i don't know it's like it's it's not it's not the best thing in the world is it but again i don't blame them because you know if you are actually working a job that actually requires you to work and you can't actually you know because there's some people that work in jobs mostly the ones that you know are housed in like a we work or a co-working space you're not really working eight hours a day you can doss a bit you can stand up and get a million coffees chat with your friends sneak up to the toilets go out to get snacks you know you can you can you can eat up a lot of time not actually working but if you're at a job that requires you to actually sit at your desk where you don't have any time to chit chat you just got your headphones in locked in on the excel sheet then i get it yeah looking forward to the week, weekend i absolutely get it because you, you've literally you know spent all your time quote unquote studying um doing homework um staring at a screen cool i understand but even then i don't know man let's maybe get a, i'd much rather get a drink a day on the way home just to kind of like for instance like you know how people don't sometimes some some people are very uh, militant about never taking their laptop home they refuse to take it home that's that's like a for them it's like a sign that work is over you close the laptop you slide it underneath your desk you go home like work is finished by the time you step out of the door you're not in work anymore i think we could do the same thing 
Um, or people could do the same thing with drinks after work. Instead of going out for drinks on a Friday night, um, even though you might be, you end up drinking more during the week, just getting one glass of wine, like one stiff drink, whiskey, no ice, a shot, whatever it may be, just one drink after work, just to kind of reset it and be like, okay, cool, it's done. Give you a little bit of a pep, especially if you've been working all day and you've been just, you know, having a salad or eating a, you know, a bagel, whatever maybe for lunch and loads of refillable waters. You're going to be so primed to get a little bit tipsy over one drink. You're going to be so ready. And then, you know, by the time Friday comes along, you're kind of tired of having an alcoholic taste in your mouth and you just dust it off. You can hang out with your friends in a bar and then just head on. That might be the best way to go about things. Just to kind of give yourself... And again, it would it would also it would also encourage a bit of spontaneity because you might end up hanging out in a bar somewhere, like, you know, just rocked up at the bar, especially if you can find a nice cocktail bar that has like a cool counter bar that you can kind of sit next to or sit, or, or sit on and chat to the bartenders, put your bag down and you never know. You might bump into an old friend that you would have never seen because... They were visiting the city for a week or, or, or just during the day and they didn't want to try during the week, but they didn't want to disturb anyone because they thought most likely no one would be out uh, up for kind of having a drink because it's a Wednesday or it's a Tuesday night. But then you happen to be there. That might be a better way to go about things as opposed to waiting for Friday, competing with all the other normies. And I don't mean that in a degrading way. I just mean like the everyday folk who tend to never go out and you also seem to descend on central London or uh, east central London which is where I basically am based on work around that EC1, EC2 area. And you're all kind of, you know, fighting for spots off the tables and seats and seat standing positions and wherever it may be in the same seven or 12 bars that occupy that little uh, circle that surrounds, I don't know, from Brick Lane to Shoreditch um, to bits of Liverpool Street. It's tiring, man. It's tiring. But again, I think everyone has to go through their own journey. And again, I think replacing it with big raves in my from, you know in my case isn't the best thing anyway because i'm still being exposed to you know some wild uh, forces let's say when you're out in those places but i don't know man i like that life better so i'm feeling fresh i'm feeling good so much so that i'm gonna go to a gym but as per usual got loads of topics to talk about loads of things to get into loads of things i've seen on the interwebs during the week that i wanted to expound on and hopefully we're gonna have a nice constructive podcast we're gonna share some jokes you know we're gonna share some links Watch some videos. You might hear some videos. What listening via the podcast app, and we're gonna continue on our way, isn't it? Nice, nice, nice. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube channel and you like what you're you're hearing, then smash that like button, click subscribe so you can come back another time. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the show. If you're listening via the podcast app, why not leave me a five star review and you know help to spread awareness. Tell me something that you like about the show. Leave me a comment. Interactive man, isn't it? Interact. Not a one-way street. Make it a two-way street. Um, so, yeah, let's get into it. Let's get into all the topics I have listed on here, and then we can go and crack on on our merry, merry, merry way. Let's see here. What do we have? What do we have? What do we have? Okay, this is something I just spotted randomly because I was um on the old Twitter feed. I've been spending a lot more time on Twitter than I have on Instagram. I think when, when it switches over to December 1st, which is going to be Sunday, I'm going to start posting a lot more on Instagram and being a bit more active on there. I have a whole host of um undeveloped film here that i'm going to also post on my instagram i'm going to use my instagram profile which is agostino zinga find me on instagram you can check me out there add me there i'm going to use that instagram profile as a platform to kind of share all of my creative works that i do personally sort of things outside of maybe djing and then i'll have a dj profile that i have specifically for the djing stuff which will be handsome dot black man handsome dot black man yeah handsome dot black dot black man right something like that is it handsome dot black man jesus christ i don't even know what is it yeah it's handsome dot black dot man i'm pretty sure that was that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna use that one so anyway but before that um i wanted to speak about this little topic that i thought was super cool or super interesting to actually expand on something i've been thinking about often and an issue that is probably hard to talk about sensibly without people kind of you know um uh, placing their feet in a little idea in a little identity politics camps or ideological camps um, and now hopefully we'll try and navigate this in the most um, honest and respectful way possible without, you know, stepping on anyone's toes, making someone feel bad about themselves. That's not the intention here. So let's try and go through this carefully. Right. So this young lady called uh, Tiffany Calver, she's a very well known DJ here in London. I don't really, I don't actually know much about her apart from I remember her coming on my radar because she um, was the tour dj for drake i think during the more life tour it must have been during more life because i'm pretty sure she yeah it was definitely more life I'm, i think that might have been the first interview he'd done in a while with this young lady she's had a she has a radio show i'm pretty sure it's a bbc or something along those kind of lines drake came over 
she was essentially the you know he's kind of go-to person in terms of plugging into the streets and understanding what everyone's kind of playing because she played that sort of like you know the stuff that everyone's playing now the uk rap stuff the afrobeat stuff she's very plugged into that community or that scene plays that stuff sort of stuff on their set really well people tend to like her i'm assuming that's why i usually get those kind of jobs so you know all in all great thing and of course it gives drake more kudos points because he's you know basically plucking out a girl that's actually on the scene actually doing bits on the weekend performing in Dawson, performing in shoreditch doing all this stuff and putting them on that stage as opposed to just plucking out some random person in america and bring them over he's actually some someone that's kind of home-based homebred so everyone wins in that regard but of course um she's kind of probably she's probably going through a lot of um inner turmoil at the moment i reckon just in terms of what i've seen on twitter for this whole twitter thread that's kind of um i've seen right uh let me see if i can get the start of it where does it come to, there's an actual start that i actually think is more interesting to start from that little actually let's go with this reply first so it looks like she's going through some stuff i think maybe you know in general usually these kind of roles or you don't really i don't think when you get even if you're a girl that's as plugged in as Tiffany Calver. I don't think you or Tiffany Calver, if they pronounce it, yeah, Tiffany Calver. I don't think if you're, if you're Tiffany Calver and you're on a come up, I don't think you ever dream of someday being Drake's tour DJ. May I don't know if if people have, maybe people are more ambitious than I am. No, I wouldn't say it's a point of ambitious am, ambition. My dreams when it comes to the stuff that I'm trying to actualize are um, in line with maybe overall goals, right, or lifestyle things. For instance, like you want to be your own boss. Um, you want to be able to call the shots. You want to have your the, the, your destiny, or you know, you, you want to basically have your destiny in your own hands. You want to be able to not be fired. Um, you want to maybe have the possibility to maybe collaborate with a certain. You want to be able to maybe get to a level of exposure where you have the possibility to collaborate another with a certain so brand. There are, I don't know. Maybe I see it more general. I don't see it so hyper focused. Maybe that's a problem. I'm not too sure, but. Even if she didn't or she did not, but I think sometimes with these bigger goals or these kind of high specific goals, once you get them, it can sometimes be a shock to the system how much else comes with that dream. So if you're saying I want to be Drake's DJ, you have to kind of, you, you'll never know what it means to be Drake's DJ once you're Drake's DJ, the pressures that come with it. So I'm assuming this is what she's kind of suffering from and it seems as if the the questions that people are raising about how she got the job, why she's there, maybe the other people that were quote unquote more deserving are questions that I think happen or will affect a lot of people in the scene, especially the bigger it gets, the more exposure it gets, because naturally, um, the, the bigger the, the scene will probably end up growing. In, I'm just talking about, you know, the kind of urban quote-unquote scene, the party scene, the lifestyle scene, because it seems as if there's like a whole generation of really cool um, UK peeps at the moment who are doing absolute bits from clothing brands to styling, uh, to I saw someone on Twitter the other day had posted a, a video clip of someone opening like a black owned health food um is it health food store health food store or like a wellness store something along those kind of lines there's actually a girl that does a really cool that has her own little wellness studio where they have like facelift no for what yeah face refreshes and all that sort of like makeovers facials and all that sort of stuff so it feels as if to me like the scene is growing bigger than the people who can fill the roles so naturally with that and because people are worried that you know quote-unquote culture vultures will come in and take those places people are just trying to slot in where they can as quick as possible so that when big, big corporations come and want to slap some money behind projects you have people there ready to take the mantle and kind of spearhead it forward but obviously in that whole shift and kind of you know rush to get in there's gonna be some people left 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 by the wayside who are gonna have legitimate gripes as to why they are not in those positions like legitimate not even like a hating thing like they, they, they have they can have legitimate points of contrition as to like why does she have that job and i don't when i've been in the scene longer i put in my work blah 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 but obviously if you're if you're familiar with the scene and you're familiar with any kind of niche thing or underground subculture you'll know that there there are so many of these kind of stories of people just getting quote unquote left behind sometimes it's because they weren't persistent enough they didn't hang around long enough they didn't network they weren't nice to hang around with they didn't do good work they weren't on time there's loads of things that happen people just get left by the wayside and other times too it's just a factor of life that you are sometimes not the chosen one at that time there are sometimes a group of what which i've seen there's always a there's always a group of like let's say five to ten people who kind of represent everyone else at a high level and then the rest of you guys kind of um you fill in the bottom the, or the middle to the bottom bit so if, it, if it's like a triangle the top bit of the triangle is the five to ten and then the majority of it eight percent of it are the people that actually support and hold the the, the 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 scene together but sometimes it can be weird because the people that are the 80 percent bit they can sometimes think 
the 20% represents the scene, but it doesn't. Actually, the scene's represented by you, your, the 80 or the entirety of the 100. And you all play a role. Um, the more work you do at the bottom, the more big work with brands at the top get. And hopefully, if the top people are nice people, they can reach back down and kind of pull a few people up as people kind of exchange and go through it. And this tweet kind of made me think about it because uh, Tiffany Culver tweeted on November 20th, um, I love this job and I wouldn't want to do anything else, but I really hope we all grow up and evolve and realize that there is really there really are women in music industry that aren't groupies. They aren't, they aren't trying to F or... They're, they're equals um so it's boring seeing comments like this constantly and again i have sympathy for it because i think because yeah, it's just difficult i think that that's, that's something a lot of people don't want to talk about in general because it's probably not an issue or probably not a topic that's of interest nowadays in the kind of political or societal you know uh, field at the moment but I, w- I have always wondered like what it must be for somebody especially if you're gonna come up and you're not very good or you haven't got to where you need to get to like for a very attractive female, what it must be like to come up in the industry and just trying to hustle and make your way in, especially if you decided to get in it late. Imagine if you're like an agent. No, imagine if you're like someone front facing like a DJ. Imagine if you've only started DJing two years ago because, you know, it just bit you one day. You know, we all start at one point. I started 10 years ago. It doesn't mean I'm I'm a better person because I've, I've been in it longer. But, you know, you might have stumbled upon a video. You might have seen an interview with somebody. And, you know, wh- wherever you get exposed to dance music, one way or the other, you get exposed to it and you want to be the person you know, on the mic, you want to be a host, you want to be a DJ, whatever, you get involved. I've always wondered what it must be like for a girl that's like, let's say, 22 and you're quite attractive. Just that's not your fault either. You know, you're, you're blessed with good genes. And then you try and get into an industry, um, you know, which is normally centered or around the nightlife scene, which obviously invites some sketchy characters in general or attracts sketchy characters. How that must be, like what that's like, especially nowadays where you know complaining about the handicap you have of being attractive might be seen as a little bit you know self-absorbed it might be a bit it might come across a bit bad so you might want to kind of bury that what are you doing if you're that girl are you purposely trying to dumb your not dumb yourself down but plain not dress up too much maybe not wear too much makeup not wear too much revealing clothes that is going to be insane in it so i guess with tiffany she's probably going through the same sort of thing right if you're a fairly good looking girl and you're suddenly been elevated to this platform it's no surprise that people that have been left behind or at the bottom or are kind of like looking up who are going to you know just go to the com- the lowest common denominator the low- lowest common denominator to explain why you're there and why they're not and sometimes it can be hating it can be just pure hate pure jealousy but sometimes it can be just a, a legitimate like question gripe why are you there when i've been here for five years and you're up there and sometimes it's just the way the world works, isn't it? Some people just get spots because they just got the spot because it's their time. They are meant to, they're like the spearhead, the figurehead that's meant to kind of um, enact some kind of change. I've kind of always said that about Virgil. I've always kind of thought that is what Virgil's place is in this scene. I think the fact that he divides so much opinion amongst even his own friendship group, I'd imagine, because you don't see many of his friends wearing his, his clothing, especially if they don't buy it, especially if it's not seeded. You don't really see them actively going out and kind of supporting what he does in that way. But I think he's very aware that he might not be the most talented, he might not be the most able, but he's going to be the example. He sets the tone for everyone else because he's insanely hardworking, so much so he had to take a medley, medically advised uh, break from the scene because he was working so hard, right? So he's going to be the standard, the standard bearer, the kind of the the bar everyone has to meet and surpass if they want to kind of get into the industry, which is good, isn't it? Because he's not, he's not a smoocher. It's not like a networking guy that kind of got his job just from being like a nice guy in a party. He got his job because he worked hard and busted his balls. So regardless of what you think of the output, it's just an example that you need just to kind of, okay, cool, I've got to work harder. So maybe those, that's where Tiffany Culver comes in that regard, right? Because if essentially, if she did make it in two years, and you're, you know, looking up at her, maybe it's a, it's more a reflection on you, not working hard enough, not doing the necessary things that need to do to network, because again, all those networking, smoochy events and industry stuff, as corny or as cheesy some people might think it is, it's very difficult to, to put your ego and pride to one side and kind of try and network and talk to people who you are not aware if they like you or not, or, you know, just generally be in a space, it's not the most comfortable thing, I don't think anyone is really made for it, and, and unless you're like a, an actual pop star, or you're trying to become a musician or an artist, or, so you kind of have to put on a face and just do it anyway, but everyone else, you know, it's hard work to be in those industry events, I know, most of my friends are still doing it now, if you buy them enough drinks and t- ask them to be honest with you, they'll tell you they hate going to these influencer things, but it pays, isn't it, that's their job, they have to kind of do what you have to do. So with Tiffany, I kind of feel a bit bad for her in that regard. But also, it needs to be there needs to be an acceptance and understanding that 
you know, it's okay that you've met, maybe made it because you're a female. It's okay that you've maybe you've maybe maybe made it because you're a nice person. People like you. It's not a bad thing. That it, that's just that's just that's probably the the that's that probably is a good indicator that we've got quite far with the whole um, diversity thing. Because now the question is kind of being raised to the women or the people who are marginalized prior when it was kind of like the bros club in these kind of scenes. Now they're seeing the same issues rise up even in the bros circuit, right? Because if you're a girl and you're thinking, oh, it's only dudes that are at, got these roles or got these gigs. Imagine the dudes that didn't get the gigs, how they must feel now that, you know, the light has been turned away from like, imagine if you're like a, you know, your average Joe white guy from Essex and stuff. Like, how, how do you feel if you're trying to get into a scene or you're trying to be like an urban DJ? What do you have to do, right? You don't have brightly colored head dreads. You don't have, you know, crazy tattoos. Just a standard dude who likes that kind of hip hop. You like, you like UK rap. It's going to be hard for you to kind of get your way in, isn't it, really, on the most part. So um, maybe some people argue against that, but I, I think that's true. And then um, this other girl kind of said a comment at the bottom, which, again, is something that a lot of people are not talking about. The idea that there are these women out there who don't mind um, exchanging sexual favors in order to uh, you know, get far in their life. I've read the Motley Crue book, Dirt, and you've probably watched the documentary. You'll know that groupie culture back then was a lot different than the groupie culture we have now. Groupies had a lot of power. They had a lot of influence. They were sometimes a glue that held some bands together. Um, they were the glue that sometimes held the scene together, introduced certain people to each other just because they were around. Um, maybe se exchanging sexual favors, maybe just being flirtatious, maybe just being the, you know, the the muse for the scene in general but they served a very integral purpose now maybe the whole term of groupie is kind of looked down upon but i don't think using any god-given gift or prowess is is a bad thing maybe when you get lost in the source it could be a bad thing but i think the idea of judging somebody for doing that is again it just goes to show that i just think the people that don't actually get to where they need to get to don't necessarily know what the game is about in it and sometimes you have to kind of sit there and say to yourself what are you willing to, what are you willing to do to get where you want to get to and if you're not willing to do that groupy stuff then you have to also be comfortable enough to say to yourself okay if someone else does it i'm not going to judge them because that's what they're willing to do we all have our different we all have different thresholds in terms of what makes us snap and some people you know the idea of going to a show and sliding into people's dms is not that big of a deal but maybe to some people it might make your skin crawl and it's okay it's, we, can, we can all kind of coexist in this planet doing the same thing but i thought the entire thread was pretty interesting actually let me actually get it up on here she sure touches on another thing that i thought was pretty interesting uh, and maybe it's just like kind of just in general she just probably feels a bit of imposter syndrome in it because the come up has been super quickly and it's been it's been a quick come up in it right so let's read the entire thread so this is the entire thread from tiffany carver on twitter from november 20th i'll post the links below so you can check it yourself but she says the following i love this job okay i've read that before um i'm learning to be okay with the ignorance and that's not okay we shouldn't be accepting it we should we shouldn't all, we shouldn't also feel like we have no to hide ourselves or prove ourselves far beyond what our talent proves already we have to raise our kids better um i'm not too sure about that i think again i think if you're tiffany corbett you have to accept that there are people that are going to say legitimately you're only there because of x y and z and you also have to accept that maybe that might be the case but that's not your fault it just isn't your fault i think the whole um introduction of females in the electronic music space especially where i'm more interested in where it comes to like you know dance music and house techno and all that sort of stuff i think it's a good thing for a long period of time i was i always just say to my friends i love it i love going to a warehouse party and you can obviously tell the person behind the decks is definitely not a guy you can just tell by the what they're playing and by the you know, just the just the texture in the air you can kind of feel that it's a girl you you go to the front of the booth and then guess what it is a girl you're like sick it's good to see because generally all these parties i go to are just full of the same looking kind of dudes and especially if you go to techno raves or techno parties in places like e1 it's the same white guy in a black t-shirt you know kind of looking demure and looking like he's hating his life playing behind decks but when you kind of open it up a bit diversity wise even again play music i think you have to be careful same with you know other areas it's still a, 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 a space that you need to be proficient at your job you can't just having people there just to fill a quota because you're going to empty out the dance floor if the person's not good and it's not going to do anyone any favors as long as they're of a good standard and they can hold their own in the, in the nightclub i think i'm i'm more i'm i'm all with the diversity thing because it just makes it more interesting makes it more refreshing but the issue that we're they're probably running into Especially the new girls I've been promoted up. I look at the likes of the Charlotte the Wits, the Amelia uh, Lenz, even the Peggy Goose. They're now noticing that they are being sniped at the same way, the same way the Richie Hortons were, the same way the Lucianos were, the same way the Ricardo Villalobos were, the same way the I don't know 
many others, Henrik Schwartz, right? All these guys were being snapped at in the same way, Chris Liebling, because they were essentially, the, they kind of represented the same archetype, the same old kind of girl. And now if you're, if you're a girl, for instance, and you don't necessarily tick any of those boxes that I mentioned of those previous girls, you might not be that social media friendly and stuff, then what do you do? So I think sometimes if that person complains about Nastia or Nina Kravitz, they're in their right to because legitimately, like, you know, it's looking like they're getting everything. Like, all the spoils are going to the person at the top, which is, again, something that happens in general anyway, right? I think any successful person you speak to, they always have that story where, you know, on the come up, they say yes to everything. Then when you get successful, you have to start saying no. And what you realize is well, when you get successful, um, the opportunities actually intensify. Like, they actually, you, they, they, um, you get inundated with a request. So much so, you don't have enough time in a day to even, uh, you know, hear them out. You just have to kind of flat out just say, look, I've got no time. I've blocked out this time to do this. Like, you just got no time. And then, then you're thinking to yourself, wow, imagine all the people kind of scrapping, especially scrapping for kind of places or opportunities, thinking that there's nothing out there. When I'm getting inundated with these offers and I'm kind of palming off to friends and all that stuff. And it's just every day your inbox is full of chances, full of opportunities, full of collaborations, full of opportunities to make money. But for the people underneath, they're not really seeing that. Um, so you continue here. Uh, the anxiety that comes from just trying to do any job is wild. And I know so many other women can relate. This is a bit of sweet feeling because we shouldn't have to find we shouldn't have to find peace in knowing we all go through the same damn struggle. But that's part of it, isn't it? I think that's part of actually achieving something and getting to where you need to get to. That struggle is real. And I also think it's just um it's not a bad thing. I don't think you need to beat yourself up over it. I think you just need to understand that look, you know, you got to where you got you got to. There might have been some luck, there might have been some good graces, someone looking up above, kind of, you know, guiding your path without you knowing. But you can't control that. What you only think that you can control is getting better um, and kind of, you know, engrossing yourself in the whatever pursuit you're doing in, you're doing at the moment and just trying to put your best foot forward, you know, because again, I, I, I really think, especially in this era now where everyone's kind of, you know, obsessed about execution and how to post things and what lighting to do and how many, you know, it's obsessed about the details. I think sometimes the other stuff, the personal stuff of just being a nice person, I think people in general, whenever I've heard people speak about this girl, people always say she's nice, she's great person everyone likes certain stuff and if you, you can even listen to the drake interview there's a lot of warmth in there a lot of kind of a lot of kind of you know a lot of love and warmth there they feel like actual friends i think it goes a long way people actually like you and are giving you chances because you're nice even if you're absolutely dead at your job i think that's great and again it's a good thing to promote right like we were in the era of at one time where it was always an image thing where people were trying to fake it till they make it if somebody's up there and people generally like them being around and they want to give them opportunities that way, I don't think that's a bad thing whatsoever. I think that's actually something that should be celebrated. Um, it kind of continues on. Um, I'm getting thicker skin, promise, but I saw one comment too many today and I'm starting to realize that by playing things down, saying nothing and quietly trying to prove myself more because of insecurities that my male peers will never have to think about is helping anybody. That's not true. I think your male peers did the same thing. I think it's natural, honestly. Like, there are times I've sometimes read interviews with DJs and stuff, people, especially people who have, like, you know, maybe been in the scene for three years and suddenly, you know, they're playing, I don't know, this person's playing house and they're at Coachella and stuff. You're like, what? You go listen to their mixes, you're like, I'm sorry, but I'm definitely better than this person, right? There are occasions I go out, especially when I go, went to, like, regular club nights and you just go, okay, cool. No, or when you go to a big club night in Fold, whatever, you might, you know, be blown away and be like, oh my God, these these people are just light years ahead of where I am now. It gets you inspired. You go home, you start mixing, you start digging for new tunes. You know, you, it really gets you inspired. But there are times when you go out and you're like, bloody hell, man. You just like, wow, this person's getting paid a grand a night, 500 quid a night, probably minimum to play music that they love in front of a captive audience and not, not an empty bar somewhere in the middle of east london or the middle of the south or nowhere land in, in a warehouse somewhere in hackney wick they're actually playing in front of a great crowd that wants them to be there they get a rider they have an agent you know all this sort of all this amazing stuff that you're working up in your head and you, you think you think like you know honestly and critically that yeah like objectively i'm better than this person that those can happen but you have to keep reminding yourself and checking yourself and saying that it's not that person's fault and sometimes it's just that that's not your time it's not your place um you just have to take that again as inspiration there might be three years into the journey but you don't know what happened before the three years everyone's got different stories everyone's got a different narrative um but it's also a legitimate um what you call it um grievance to have well it's not obviously it's not going to serve you well to concentrate too much on how tiffany Corver got there so quickly it's not going to serve you any you know it's not going to do anything for your career but to someone to sit down and maybe to make a comment and say, hey, I think it's unfair that you got that role is one thing. 
that's that's up to them they can do that but i think as the person as a kind of star that's been left that comment you probably have to just internalize it as just them kind of you know it's more of a reflection on the person commenting as opposed to you it's more so the pain that they're kind of going through just kind of keep it moving there's nothing you can do really you can't combat it in a real honest if you're really honest with yourself there's nothing you can really say that's going to knock back that argument of like hey i think it's unfair that you're where you are and i'm where i am when i've been in it longer do you know that kind of argument and i get it it can make me make you think a bit shitty but i don't think the person that's at the top has to overcompensate and work harder and kind of make it look like oh, I'm, I'm always at work i'm not doing stuff and not post because i imagine that would be something that'd be really weird in it playing in your head imagine you're that girl you're like a tiffany and you don't and it feels that people think that you only got there because of x y and z maybe subconsciously it will make you um hesitant to start posting pictures of yourself on holiday put yourself of, of you enjoying yourself buying yourself nice things because people are all making to say oh wow that's that's what you know sucking so and so whatever is going to get you that would be mad, didn't it? And you can't think of that. You just have to let people have their opinion, what they have to say. Even if it's illegitimate, even if it's full of nonsense, even if it has some points or some credence to it, and just keep it moving, really. That's what it means to operate at that level anyway. You just have to kind of be able to kind of listen to those around you, close, especially family and friends who kind of have your best interest at heart, and the rest of it, just kind of leave it by and by. And if you stumble up across something that does kind of pull out your heartstrings or does make you think, cool, think about it for a moment and just keep it moving. What else can you do? Um... And it's just the following here. Um, a really big, ro- a, a really, uh, a really big uh, reason I took the role on that I have now is because I really hoped it would help to switch the narrative, inspire more women to do anything in this world, and know that gender, like many things, should never hold you back. Eh. Again, I don't think that holistic kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, save the save your whole gender thing is going to help you there either. Those playing those games, I would say, I would say, you know, it's no, sh- it's the, the, the you shouldn't be ashamed, you shouldn't be. Um, shy to say that you know you're ambitious and took that big job because you wanted it it was a great opportunity cool if it so happens to inspire some women fair enough but you have to also be aware that it's going to piss some girls off isn't it because there's some girls legitimately who are going to think that you shouldn't have that job or you don't deserve it that's fine but all you can do with your platform is you know pull your hand back like same with the virgil stuff how many personal hype you have to go through to see people calling virgil a fraud but every all of his friends are around him his collaborators they love the guy because every opportunity he gets he's able to put other people on whether it's a stylist a photographer uh, you know a set designer whatever it may be he's always putting people on so everyone's kind of contributing to his uh glow up and in general that kind of habit from that person at the top is going to then filter down to the people at the bottom it's very unlikely that if he plucks some assistant um out from the depths of instagram to help him out that, that person's going to be really tight with the opportunities they're also going to want to try and give back to to kind of you know extend that lineage and you can do the same thing too you can't help how people interpret it it is what it is um but this idea that you're somehow rallying the female gender or women in general to kind of you know uh, pursue their dreams is a little bit of a misnomer and i think nowadays too to be completely honest there's never been an easier time to make it as a woman really in it especially a woman of color or you know a, a person from a uh, a minority group it's probably the best time because everyone's looking for somebody especially if you've got some level of talent to appeal to that kind of audience because that's the audience that they quote unquote want to capture or want to um seem as if they represent so i don't know again i just think there's there needs to be more blinders especially if she's at the top of that level she just needs to just kind of focus on what she's doing and not care about the noise and the last bit here before i finish i was terrified before my first show because i knew all of the things that were going to come with the change this was a big one it's sad that the fear i had then is still constant fear i have today but i'm okay with it taking the talk talk, taking the bullshit if it means someone else doesn't have to one day Eh, everyone's gonna take bullshit i don't think it's ever gonna end especially in the social media world i think it's just it's just too easy that's probably why the likes of logan paul and jake paul get so much hate on the internet we all know how youtube videos are made we all know how to do jump cuts and when you're seeing somebody you know winning on that level and being so reckless with it it's only natural that if you're a youtube creator that you'd also hate their guts right it's, it makes complete sense there's nothing wrong with that but i think if you're jake paul and logan paul you can't ever think about or focus on what those people are saying you just have to kind of isolate yourself incubate yourself around the people that are trying to make content to trying to pursue their dreams and just keep putting out content especially if the audience likes it because again like i say the market always decides if the market has kept this girl in a job at the bbc um if the if she's getting good listens and good plays then the market is deciding that they like you. They've, they've, they're deciding with the times that they're pressing play on that online radio player, right? Especially nowadays in the era of podcasting. Like, who the hell is listening to radio? I don't listen to radio. People are listening to radio and they're tuning into a show. They actually like you. 
Do you know what I mean? They, they proper think you're good. They proper think you're sick. And if people like Drake are, you know, wanting you to go on tour with him and be his tour DJ, he thinks you're sick too. And then people see you playing like, oh, that girl's actually really good. And they want you to play and you get more bookings. So it's essentially the market deciding your value. The moment the market doesn't think your value has matches your talent or matches your 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 platform that's when the gigs will start to decrease and obviously things will start falling by the wayside hopefully not but you know that's how it goes so to so to think somehow that's going to change or never will change and that's how it is that's how it's always been but i think again maybe it's just an imposter syndrome thing uh maybe again it is kind of a self-sabotage thing too because she just mentioned in this tweet i was terrified before my first show because i knew what would, the good things i knew i knew the things all the things that would uh we're going to come with a change and that happens quite a lot in it self-sabotaging where you kind of you kind of mess things up for yourself because you're uncomfortable with the idea of potentially reaching a really a really high level that will then require you to do things that you're probably not willing to do at that point in time whether it's kind of focus completely on work and not go out whether it's invest your money in the little side hustle you're doing sometimes we all do as humans because you're so afraid of actually trying to reach your dreams which is probably why which is probably um the main reason or the main crux of a lot of especially actual legitimate haters i'm not talking about people that actually have an opinion on your career and think it's unfair but i think legitimate haters that's probably where they come from their point of pain i would assume is that when they see someone like a tiffany or someone that's actually doing their thing and going for their dreams it just is a a direct mirror reflection of what it's kind of it serves as a mirror for why for why they're not where they should be essentially and it makes them feel uncomfortable when someone's really ambitious and really confident and you know talks a big game backs it up delivers 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 it makes them uncomfortable because it shows that you can do it if you believe in yourself and that in general they're kind of holding themselves back they're their own worst enemy i kind of relate a little bit back to like you know my mum, you know and a, a conservative african woman who anytime i mention i'm going to invest a bit of money in a party or put an event on or buy some equipment or whatever it may be for this tiny project that i'm doing she'd be she's very like risk averse very scared because her whole entire life she's had to battle scrimp and save to kind of feed you know and house three young boys you know growing up in london and trying to make sure no one dies and no one ends up in prison so the idea of kind of taking a risk doesn't work in her head because she's under the guise of like if i keep my head down work hard i'll get my passport i'll vote labor i'll keep my counter house and i'll keep trucking on so to so to get offended at my mum thinking that what i'm doing is a bad idea or that i'm wasting my money or that i'm being stupid is it is is doesn't make any sense because i understand her point of view i understand her point of pain that she's coming from i think you have to kind of have the same sort of sympathy or empathy when it comes to people online leaving random comments i'd say just kind of strip away the the venom in it probably don't see it as a direct insult or directly towards you and maybe see it more as a reflection of where that person's coming from i would say anyway i'm not too sure maybe i don't really have the reason to but again i think it's an interesting point to be at the moment now like the girls coming through now i know i kind of going through the same thing some of the bigger dudes were going through when they first get into a scene and they were winning and sweeping up everything i'm pretty sure even in the edm world i'm pretty sure there's a gazillion guys in the EDM world who are banging out tunes, uploading them out on SoundCloud and getting two listens who are kind of annoyed that Martin Garrix keeps getting all the awards and getting flown around the world in private planes, isn't it? Like, it's just, they're probably annoyed too. It is what it is. You just have to kind of keep it moving and hope that in the end, you know, other people, in the end, other people also get their chances. But I think for the ones that are sniping on the outside, you have to understand that everyone has their role to play. She just, that's her role. She's meant to be the person at the BBC doing these kind of big commercial things. And maybe your place is to do something else. Um, you have to create your own opportunities, isn't it? I think in that regard, you can't wait around those pointing and fingers and stuff. That doesn't work. Anyway, let's move on. Next on the list here, we've got Brendan Shaw beef. Brendan Schwab beef, which is very, very interesting. Um, Brendan Schwab's a bit, is, a, is another one that kind of maybe falls into that lane of the Tiffany Cole thing that I mentioned previously. It's just a, whereas I think with the Brendan Schaub issue, which you, you're probably not aware of, Brendan Schaub is a host of, well, one of the hosts on The Fighter and Kid, a very close friend of Joe Rogan. He's a former UFC fighter who's now gone into be a, uh, a comedian and an overall lifestyle uh, podcaster and just an all around, you know, um, entertainment dude doing some cool and interesting stuff. But it's been interesting to watch from the outside in being a big TFAT K uh, viewer. Uh, that's the Fire and the Kid acronym. But it's been a big, uh, it's been interesting to watch it from afar just how quickly the fans have turned on him like you know like um every youtuber has that thing where the fans turn on you i think recently h3 h3 ethan klein kind of went through that um where when they started stopped kind of uploading their video stop uploading the videos they did on their main channel and essentially started up a podcast and you know just essentially 
uh, bin the whole sketches on YouTube thing and just concentrated more on the podcast and it kind of riled up their original fan base, especially when uh, in a podcast, especially in the two hour format or in even an hour format, like I'm talking here, you, you guys, you know, you guys get to know me quite well. I'm pretty consistent in my personality. I'm not trying to be something I'm not on this platform. So I think it's the same with somebody like Ethan Klein who has a bigger platform than I have. So I think fans got to maybe, it was maybe a shock and surprise to see that the person that you liked in those 10 minute video segments was a different person when you sit them down and talk for an hour. So, you know, some, some of these personality quirks that people weren't really too fond of came to bear. And, you know, the whole hate um, Ethan Klein train kept chugging along. Now it's kind of stalled a little bit, but it feels like the Brendan Schaub hate train hasn't stopped moving. It, it's, it's intensified as the kind of years are progressing as he's got more successful. And I think it's understandable. I think it makes a lot of sense because unlike Tiffany Colvin, the DJing thing, oh, maybe it's the same. Maybe it's the same year. I think because Brendan Schaub is a comedian or he's trying to be a stand-up comedy, a comedian, I think he's three years into it now. And he's got so much so quickly in his early part of his career. And this, you know, by and large, the stand-up industry is very much um, the, 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 the arc or the kind of trajectory of you to kind of get to the top is kind of, you know, it's a story that we all know. Open mics, hustle for ages you only get good up maybe after 10 years and then you start making it maybe after 20 it's just about a game about just staying hanging in there you know for for dear life and then hoping some chances come along your way and hoping you have enough self-awareness and the talent and hard and good work ethic to kind of recognize your flaws write new jokes and just keep getting up again and again and again and again and again right that's essentially what the, what the trip is but Brennan Shaw obviously flipped on his head by being extremely popular on the very well being one of one of one of the uh, driving forces behind a very popular podcast that kind of garnered a large audience, and then kind of segueing that audience into his comedy career, which then allowed him to kind of leapfrog the entirety of that whole open mic stage uh, time thing. You know, I'm pretty sure he mentioned a few times in interviews his first time performing, quote unquote, stand up was in front of a sold out crowd, right? Like that came to specifically see him. And when you're doing open mics, and I know this from doing open decks as a DJ. Everywhere you go, no one wants you to be there, right? So you're having to fight that battle from the beginning. And also you're surrounded by people who are terrible for the most part. If you're in that kind of open mic, open deck arena, most people that you're standing with are not going to be the next, you know, Carl Cox. They're not going to be the next Eddie Murphy. We know that for real. So to, to, to so, so for somehow to kind of rise from that debris of um, awful, average, untalented people and actually make it is a you know once in a million chance like for brendan to go from literal zero to where he is now with the showtime special it makes sense that some comedians won't like him and wouldn't have a good thing to say about him but i think the hate on the forums has got a bit crazy and i think um this comment from uh louis j gomez kind of speaks upon it because louis j gomez and brendan have kind of had a little bit of a subliminal you know, beef here and there, I think, because of what Brendan Schaub said about Ellis Mania, because I think Brian Callum went to fight on there one time, and then Brendan was like, that's a terrible idea, why would you do that? And there's kind of like been a bit of a weird little beef between them, right? And I, mean, I, I just imagine the way the Legion of Skanks people are, and how they kind of go hard in their pain, and in the most offensive podcast in the world, I imagine that kind of humour, or that kind of busting of the balls doesn't really um, vibe well with Brendan. I think I, I remember him mentioning something along the lines of being in the green room and being really hurt that Anthony, Anthony Jessonek said something really mean about him on stage when he came and kind of introduced him. And, you know, if you know anything about Jessonek, you know that that's kind of his humour. That's his, essentially his stick. But I just think he doesn't really do well with that kind of humour. So I'd imagine that's why it didn't work out. But I think this comment by Luis J. Gomez really did, or Luis J. Gomez, sorry, really did um, speak to the idea that I think sometimes fans can build up a narrative in their head as to why people hate this person. And also it sometimes isn't that serious. Um, I think comedians, especially if you're not successful, you're. I think you should be, you should be, um, you should be allowed to hate Brendan Shaw if you're a comedian and you're not successful. Because if he's three years in and he's like, let's get this Instagram up, right? If he's three years in and he's able to, I don't know, where's that picture? Yet? If he's three years in and he's got a car like this and you're a stand-up comedian, I get that you hate the guy. I understand it, right? And if we're looking at this picture of a Porsche. 911 I think um in some amazing Tiffany blue color with these great rims and you know bright yellow um brake pads it makes sense to hate the guy because you're in the trenches and he's kind of leapfrogged what you're doing obviously it's not going to serve you in the long term you probably need to kind of focus more on what this guy is doing right and what you're doing wrong and kind of trying to copy that in your own way to see if that's going to help your career go forward but it makes sense for some communities maybe to have some ill will to say about him but I think for the fans outside of it 
who are kind of watching from the sidelines. I think it's getting a bit OTT. And also I think you have to realize that sometimes people are just like, this is just a, this is life. This is like, Brendan Shaw is a representation of what happens in life every day. My first job, I was, yeah, I didn't get my first job until I was like maybe 18, 19. And that only came because I mentioned previously, my dad's friend or my uncle, sorry, was a, was basically the janitor of Hollywood Bowl, which is a, a big uh, bowling arcade thing that we used to have here in London that closed down a while back. But he was a janitor then. He basically, essentially gave me a good word to the manager. They got me in. They sold the gig as some other thing. And then when I started, I was just working behind the, the chicken nugget stand, right? Doing my thing. No no bother. But I was happy, innit? I was making my little money. I was able to take girls out on dates, get my, you know, tractors from JD Sports, living a good life. But I only got that job because my uncle got me that's it he brought me in i was handing out cvs for like a good two summers constantly going out photocopying stuff like you know handing out cvs every shop i could go poundland whatever it doesn't matter any shop i'd go to i didn't get one callback no intro nothing obviously at that time i didn't have any experience even on paper so i understood why i did i wasn't a good candidate but i only got my job because my uncle and i think that is an accurate representation of life sometimes people just get lucky breaks or they know the right people and they are able to kind of get forward in life and that is just the way it is now it's not always fair we know that but life isn't fair that's just the general reality of it but i think some people on that, on that subreddit especially the, the fighting kids subreddit they have it in their head that i don't know that he shouldn't be this rich and shouldn't be this successful he's been able to make it as a stand-up comedian in another unconventional way i think it should be celebrated i think it should be heralded in some regard whether or not he deserves to be on certain platforms is up for debate. Who really cares about it? But I think if you're if you're a, a person watching for the sidelines and you're just a you know a fan of the podcast, to kind of snipe at him and to kind of create this division between the comedians is weird because I think deep down, even the comedians that don't like the guy have to respect the hustle, isn't it? He, he, he took the a really popular podcast and kind of you know uh, segued it into a really successful stand up career that led to other kind of opportunities. That should be heralded. That is essentially what everyone's doing nowadays, right? everyone's got a podcast everyone's got um their own little quote-unquote um marketing platform in terms of an instagram profile everyone's posting or trying to catch a lick on twitter and post something viral or make a, a really good meme or go back and forth with a really influential youtuber like Kristen Lee went back with you with um jake paul maybe do a really viral video like burt Kreischer and tom segura right everyone's trying to do something everyone's got their little different avenues that they're kind of uh, going on in order to kind of gain you a new audience or kind of increase their exposure that's what everyone should be doing now whether or not you know the level of success he has matches his quote unquote um journey in the pro journey in the whole thing overall is maybe up for debate but it doesn't it's not even but it's not even worth talking about because it is what it is isn't it but i think lucio gomez spoke about it really well in this little um ramble that he had when he was on twitch i'm going to definitely play it for you now so you guys can hear it let me just take it off the screen so i can get it up for you but I thought this really spoke about it well, and I think hopefully this goes a long way to kind of quelling some of the um, vitriol against him on the on his subreddit because I know a lot of podcasts, especially Ethan Klein on H3, like they, I think even your mum's house, they do it. They go through their Reddit and kind of, you know, maybe find topics to talk about. Maybe someone posts some good clips or something, but I don't think Defying Kid staff can ever go on that subreddit, Defying the Kid subreddit especially, and get anything helpful from there because the, everyone on there absolutely hates the guy. Like, they hate him for real. They hate his guts. Like, and I've never seen such vitriol, such anger towards him. Um, but let's play the video first and then I'll, I'll, I'll get a little comment up that says, that basically breaks down why some people hate him so much. If nobody, nobody really has a problem with Brendan Schaub. That's why you guys are fucking like, everyone's like, one of the floodgates coming up, but one of the gloves coming off. Why don't you actually just fucking say it like it is? Why don't you say, I hate Brendan Shaw, fuck Decker. Because nobody dislikes the guy. The guy's a nice guy, I believe. I mean, I only met him once. He was very nice when I met him. Uh, but you know, the funny thing about this is that as funny as like, you know, as kind of um respectful and honest as Louis J. Gomez is being, the Puerto Rican rattlesnake. If you've listened to Legion of Skanks, if you've listened to rap, you'll know that this guy says some wild stuff. And you know that if he, like, you know that part of the reason why he's kind of holding back a little bit too has to do with Joe Rogan, which is another part of this, probably the story of, of uh, Brendan Shaw people don't like. You know, I think it's quite clear that if he didn't have a Joe Rogan in his corner, he wouldn't have been as successful as he is now in that kind of comedy space, maybe. I don't know. We can't really say for certain because... 
podcasting is so big now he could have probably still been in a level that he's at now segue that in somewhere the like but it's pretty obvious obvious to us looking from the outside in that joe rogan even though he's not he doesn't really flex it that much he is quite a well-respected and powerful person um in comedy in the comedy circuit in the entertainment circuit i'd imagine if you're a comedian and you have the opportunity to get on the joe rogan podcast and I, I, you know what i judge it on i judge it on um what's his name uh one one half from the uh about last night podcast adam ray went on joey diaz recently and um, joey diaz said in passing that joe rogan said he liked adam ray's set like you know said something nice about his set and adam ray was like mentioning it two or three times again oh did, did joe really say it? joe really say that and that automatically made me think especially as well thinking about how the legions of skanks were when they went on joe rogan the first time how well behaved they were it made me understand just how much um reverence people treat joe rogan with how much of a deity he is how looked up how people really respect this guy in this scene so i'd imagine if you're a comedian and you get a, an opportunity to go on his platform a lot like brendan shop has because they're friends they're best friends and he kind of supports your career he gives you good career advice that it can obviously speed up your process right it can you know it's happened to authors authors go on his show on joe rogan's podcast and promote a book and the book sells out or it jumps up you know a million places on the new york times bestseller list it does help in that regard but you also have to understand that comedy especially you have to put bums in seats he can you know joe rogan can help out brendan shaw get him an introduction maybe get him a few podcast sponsors put some money in his pocket but if joe if brendan shaw wants to feed his family if he wants to you know ex- expand his family he wants to provide for his family wherever it may be he's gonna have to be good at his job you, you know it's like when they always mention about famous people when they go get up on stage and do a bit of time or try and pursue stand-up comedy they get about maybe what's that three minutes on stage to kind of you know um use their celebrity to kind of get a few laughs after that you have to be funny you have to deliver the goods. so i think even though brendan shaw might have got an unfair leg up he still had to run the whole way right that's it he still had to run the whole way and um, and he's running he's been running consistently for a while if you've seen what he's looked like so far in these clips that he uploads onto youtube especially you know in instagram lately you can tell he's been you know working day in day out especially with a new kid on the way so i don't think it's anything that's been earned you know just because he knows joe but it's there it's obvious it's obvious you can tell that you know lewis j doesn't want to piss off joe rogan too much by going at brendan shop too hard because again why would you too as well it's like what for the entertainment of like some no some you know some randoms on the reddit it doesn't make any sense in it really um yeah i think that's why most comedians don't openly trash it um yeah it's as simple as that like and then it's like you know comics uh, there's like a fucking there's a weird brotherhood no matter how good or bad you might think somebody is you know even comics that i fucking hate like fucking open mic sjw feministy lesbian fucking purple hair assholes that would hate me that would literally try to take me down i still have a weird sense of kinship with those people so i think that which i which i like actually in comedy circuit which you see a lot of, i think in the early days there was a lot more sniping or a lot more kind of gossip but it wasn't like um um it wasn't like mean spirited it was just like gossip oh i can't believe they got that comedy they got this but it, i do like the kinship when someone's in trouble no one tries to dog pile alone which is probably why you got such a um peyton oswald and uh judd apatow got such a negative reaction from the comedy from other fellow comedians when they started you know virtue signaling because for the most part no one does that even if people think you're horrible they're never gonna kind of dog pile on top of you if if if, if, if anything which i think is awesome if, if if they think you're an untalented hack and you're suddenly getting attacked and, and trying to get cancelled you're probably going to get more support from people that you probably would never think will support you because they feel a level of uh, kinship and they also know that that could easily be them so they want to put a good foot forward they want to also make an example that you know this is not what we don't do this and i guess in comedy too because it's so insular and because it's such a risque art form it sort of helps your career sometimes too you know look at um lou uh lou ck is a good example you know you can literally get away with anything if you you know to a to a certain extent in comedy and as long as you do right by other comedians you should be okay you should be pretty fine you can kind of come back in and make a career for yourself but why you don't like there's just no reason it's not like he's a dude who's going out and fucking trashing people and being shitty to people exactly. you know what i'm saying like he just kind of 
I get it. I get why people. <laughs> the reason I take shots at him. And again, it's not his fault either. He got a Showtime special in two. I think the Showtime special is a probably the big thing that he probably might look back on and maybe regret. I still think he didn't need to take it. He probably could have not taken it and probably done his, show, his special now after three years and been a lot better than what he was maybe at a two-year mark. It just wasn't good. Um, it, even just the outfit. I remember him talking such a big game about he spent so long about his outfit. He had it in mind for ages. And you look at the video, it's just him wearing all black with brightly colored trainers. It wasn't as interesting of an outfit as he wears day-to-day -day when they're firing a the kid. He's probably had better outfits on the firing a the kid than he's had ever on, stand, on that um uh, you'd be surprised uh, special and also I think you wasted the name I think that you'd be surprised name should have been done as a debut now maybe five years in it's such a cool name for a special especially after the whole story you know with basically Joe Rogan uh, telling him he should quit MMA and you know uh, Brendan Shaw's reply you'd be surprised I think you wasted that that time that kind of that moment you probably should have done it again but again it's not his fault I get the whole rationale behind it there was a long-term plan in terms of him being associated with Showtime and it's worked out pretty well from his career wise. You can't say it's a mistake. But I think in terms of the vitriol that he happens with the community, that's where it comes from. But we can move away from this because that's what Luke J. Gomez is basically speaking about. You can kind of watch the video yourself. But I think there's a comment on Reddit that kind of expands on why people exactly don't like him. And again, I think it just... It's a bit short-sighted, I think, in my experience. But let me see if I can get it up on here for you guys to see um so this is a re this is some a reason why someone said i think this is a clip of brendan talking on a show uh and here's what he says oh yeah so it's, this, this is a clip of brendan talking this is a response from him right so this is, i'm gonna get this up on reddit here uh this is brendan talking about haters because he does this a lot and i think this is what uh, annoys the haters i think it's just like stop mentioning it he does always say he doesn't read comments but you know he probably does and it just it just stirs the pot more. It's just annoying, isn't it? For the people that are sniping and for him himself, just completely ignore it and just keep it moving. But this is what he said, right? They can't even imagine this. And when they when they were kids, their dreams weren't to be these losers in their mom's basement hating on successful people. So they have just such resentment against people who are doing great creative shit. You know. 100%. So he's obviously that talking happened. about himself, but in this regard. The resentment isn't just because he's successful. I think that someone pointed out in the comments and said, uh, no one hates successful people for doing great creative work. We hate Brendan Schaub because, or Slob, they mentioned here, being super disrespectful because um, he's the beneficiary, the benef the beneficiary sorry, of undeserved success. He's a comic who can't tell a joke and a commentator who can't speak properly. He's a stupid, arrogant bully who has consistently failed upwards. People have an innate sense of fairness and although... And we admire success. We despise undeserved success. That's why we hate you, Brendan, because there is, there. if there were any justice in the world, you'd be bartending in your hometown, effing your friend's wives and drunkenly contemplating suicide. Jesus Christos, instead of getting rich as an entertainer. Now, obviously, the last couple of sentences are a little bit mean and a bit over the top. But the general sentiment from these people on the outside, again, they're not comedians. Other com or even maybe other comedians. Other comedians have got legitimate reasons not to like the guy. They can just say, look, He's three years in. He's got a Showtime special. Um, you know, he's got a great look, looking family, big mansion, great cars, all the trappings of material success, great network of friends, seemingly, and he seems to be living a happy life. It's annoying. I get it. If you're a, a comedian, because he's got success that doesn't make any sense for a comedian but again you have to understand he's not really a comedian he's more of a podcaster which is probably a lot more lucrative in his comedy career he'd probably have to say i don't know would he say that maybe not i don't i'm not just sure i don't know anyone's pockets but i think for the commentators outside again it goes back to the tiffany Culver thing that i mentioned in the other bit of the segment of the show people don't people are really naive about how people actually make it some people make it because of their friends or because of the network. That's why a lot of successful people, when they're telling you about their story, some will say, I got lucky. Some will say, it's who you know. Some will say, this person changed my life. Because what happened in that story is that they were doing the work. For instance, if you're a stand-up comedian, they were doing the bare minimum, which, which you have to do to enter, to kind of be part of the conversation. Write your own material, go up consistently, and keep it new and fresh and interesting, right? Learn from your mistakes, all that sort of stuff. So that you're doing the bare minimum. You're going up every day or every week, wherever it may be. You're writing new stuff every day. You're trying to change up your set. You're self-reflective. Um, you're aware. You're not being deluded. And you're constantly trying to bring it every time you go up on stage, right? You're doing the bare minimum. Then along that journey, whether it's two year, three year, four year, five year, if you happen to be lucky enough to bump into a really amazing producer or agent or manager who's able to, you know, take your career 
you know, five years forward in the space of maybe a couple of months, what are you meant to do? Are you meant to not take that chance? Are you meant to say, oh, no, man, I can't do that because I want people on Reddit thinking that I'm, un I'm an undeserved success story. That's ridiculous. You should take that chance. And what makes um, Brennan Schaub's story even more interesting is that he's been able to kind of, again, take the, plat the, the, the podcasting platform and immediately just slap alongside it, being a con commentator, an analyst, a lifestyle podcast host, a comedian, all these other things on top of it, and it's been able to kind of grow exponentially because if he's a stand-up comedian and he goes and he goes to a comedy club, you know, he's, he can legitimately say, look, I can sell tickets for this place. I can sell this place out. What's, what are the comedy clubs meant to do? Get him to do an open mic set. Get him to do a 9 to 10 set in a random town. No, you might just give him the whole evening, let him bring his own openers in, let him actually, you know, sell some tickets, get some people in, sell some drinks, sell some food and keep making money. But so that's that, that's the thing that just don't, I just don't get with some people that are on Reddit. Like, are you not in a real world? Have you never been in a job where someone's got a promotion that they don't deserve because they know the manager? Like, it happens all the time. But then once you've got the job, you still have to perform. That's the thing that people are uh, misunderstanding. I don't think there's many people in big, higher-up positions who don't know what they're doing. For the most part, they might not be as proficient as you want them to be, but they know some aspects of the jobs. And they might not be, they might not have got the job the way you wanted it to get the job, but that's the way the world works. Sometimes people get stuff, you know, just, I don't know what you, what you can say. Like that, that's, that's a major part of the success story of being able to have cultivated network. So again, I don't blame, I don't blame it, man. I think it's a good thing, actually. I think, again, it goes to show that there's other ways to get money, other ways to succeed in the comedy business, especially, you know, looking at how it must have been for the previous people in the, in a, you know in an era where people were looking to get TV deals and stuff. Imagine now, if you're a stand-up comedian, you probably don't need to travel much to make a lot of money. You can essentially make a lot of money through podcasting, uploading videos on YouTube. You're, you can upload your clips on YouTube, maybe get bookings that way and tour you know, for maybe four months of the year, maybe if that, and you know, still look after your family, provide. Why wouldn't you do that? So again, I, I'm I'm not too sure why why everyone's sniping. Again, I think maybe it is a little bit of undeserving success thing, a bit of jealousy. I don't know, but the vitriol on that four on that subreddit, mate. I recommend no one from their team check it because they hate the guy super hard. I just don't understand. I really don't. But anyway, what can you do? Anyway, that's one hour. Thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna head to the gym now. It's excellent thing show episode number two six two right uh as per usual for all things concerning myself click my website accidentalzinger.com you'll be able to find listings for my dj gigs other bits and pieces that i do um some design works on there too i'm going to open my store back up again i think maybe the beginning of the new year so keep attention to that there'll be some good little bits of merch on there as well um if you listen via the podcast app leave me a five star review of course that'll go a long way people who find the show if you're watching via youtube smash that like click subscribe you know do the rest leave me a comment interact let me know what you think of the show but until then i'll see you guys very very soon hopefully maybe tomorrow maybe another one later on today but if i don't see you then have a good saturday enjoy your time drink loads of water cover your drinks if you're a lady if you're a guy make sure your phone's charged up your friends can find you and i'll see you again very very soon take care peace be well bye